Um, namaste, everybody. Um, my name is Siddhartha, and as uh, Sri Balaji Mahodeya said, um, I will be conducting one or two sessions at the Unmesha camp in August. So, um, and I'd like to thank, obviously, the organizers for having me. Um, and I'm very honored that I, I, I'm the, I seem to be the model student and very flattered, but we'll see how true that is. Um, so if you could, if the presenter could move to the next slide, um, I don't have that control, unfortunately. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, so just a bit about me, um, and also sorry, I, I'm I'm attending from a a mobile phone, so I can't put my camera on, unfortunately. But we'll try to make it work. Okay, um, so yeah, I was born and brought up uh, in the in the United States till about till until I was about ten years old. Um, and after that, uh, our, fa we, our family, we moved to Chennai, where I've been, and since then we've been going back and forth between India and the, and the US. Um, and I was also homeschooled. I've been homeschooled since I was in, the, in third grade, um, and, um, and I have continued to do so till last year when I graduated high school. Um, and over those years, apart from my, you know, my, the stand, my standard education in uh, in mathematics, um, your English, the sciences, etc. Um, my education was also largely made up of, um, you know, learning Sanskrit, um, doing Veda Jainam, learning the Vedas, and also learning Carnatic classical music. And so those played a huge role in, I think, shaping my my own ed education and my own curriculum throughout uh, throughout you know middle school and high school, and. So I'm currently actually taking a gap year before I attend college in the fall. Um, and, um, and so I've taken this gap year actually to, to, to spend some more time uh, to, to sort of to take a deeper dive into Sanskrit and music in particular. Um, because, you know, of course, as, as many of you might know with, with children my age, uh, school nowadays is really crazy and hectic. So um, for me, I had to take this, I felt I had to take this gap year, you know, sort of take it take it at my own pace. But I will talk more about that and, and my experiences with the gap year later on. Um, so yeah, like I said, so I took this gap year to you know, focus on my to learn Sanskrit and, um, and Carnatic music as well. And so I thought I'd share a few things that, that I felt Sanskrit and Carnatic music have done for me um, as traditional systems of knowledge. Um, next slide, please. Uh, okay, yeah, you can move on to the next one after this. Okay, so I first thought I'd cover Vyakaranam, or in other words, Sanskrit grammar. So I don't know how familiar most of you are with, with how Sanskrit grammar works, but basically, just a quick introduction, um, the, sort of the foundational work in Sanskrit, Sanskrit grammar is called the Ashtadhyayi. Which is an eighth chapter work by Panini, um, uh, and so basically this this work contains a, a, a bunch of sutras, um, and these sutras a sutra is basically sort of I guess the direct translation is an aphorism, but they're just very like small command like like words or compilations of words, and they don't necessarily make much sense when you read them, but but Panini has given sort of this framework through which, and this lens through which, when you read the sutras, you can understand their meaning and what they're trying to convey. So it's a lot like when you read a computer program, you know, you won't necessarily understand anything that's written there because you might like, uh, you might recognize a few words from English, but the entire the structure of the computer program doesn't really make sense until you know the syntax and semantics of the computer language. And so that's basically what Panini is in many ways. And so, I, as you'll notice, I'll be drawing a lot of parallels between computer science and Parini, um, because uh, the you know the comparisons are sort of you can't really ignore them. They're they're quite stunning actually. Um, and just for uh, and just sort of to give you an introduction to that, um, for those of you who have any uh, you know familiarity with Java, um, you know that there are like a bunch of different data types. So right? you have int, char, boolean, all that. Um, and so in the in the very same way. Panini too defines data types, um, and when it comes to letters and pratyayas, and pratyayas are basically suffixes and prefixes you add on to different words to 
give them a, a certain meaning. Um, but so basically what Panini does is he assigns, he has certain sutras or uh, lines that, that designate, be it a letter, say the letter A, as a guna. And so after that sutra, at some point he will bring that down and say, when there is a guna letter here, you do this action. And so now, given that you know what a guna is, uh, because you've studied the sutras previously, that, that dictate what a guna is, you know that, okay, I have to apply this rule to this letter. And that's, very sim that's a very similar methodology that's applied in computer programs. Um, and so, like I mentioned here, there are a bunch of different sanyas or what are known as a sort of designations in Panini. And in fact, there's a whole, I believe, there's a bunch of sutras, a hundred odd sutras that, that, look at, that look at designating different quantities as different, as just different forms of data. So there's a like guna, there is vriddhi, there is udatta, anudatta, svarita, there is it, sanya, there is apit, pit, nit. So it goes on, of course, none of these probably make much sense to any of you, but when you take a deeper look at Sanskrit and Vyakranam, you'll see that there are tons of similarities to the way it's structured um, as similarities to a computer program. So um, I, I thought I'd explore a few of those as well during my lectures, and I think it'd be an interesting exercise to see that you know a language doesn't necessarily have to just be a language. It can be an exercise in computer science if you wanted to. Um, and so, apart from that, uh, apart from that sort of interesting aspect of Sanskrit as a as a sort of computer science like structure, having a computer science like structure, um, Vyakaran, learning Vyakaranam itself, I think, can give you a really solid understanding of language because ultimately you're learning a language here. Um, and so. So, because you know, someone might ask, I mean, okay, it might be similar to how computer science is structured, but why bother studying it, right? I might as well just go and learn computer science as it is. Um, and you're probably, you're probably right if that was all that was there, but learning the acronym, I think, is, is not only just sort of a mental exercise uh, in, in the way that I just mentioned, but also I think it gives you a really solid understanding of how language is structured. Um, so if any of you have ever looked at either English grammar, for example, um, the way sentences are structured is very arbitrary. You know, the order can change, and it's not really dictated. In you know, in it's not really spelt out for you. Um, but whereas in Panini, there is a whole uh, prakarana called the Karaka prakarana, which which basically dictates to you every uh, how a sentence is structured and and what what sort of, what like tenses are used in which sense, which vibhaktis are used in which sense. So I, I believe that is uh, uh, the first adhyaya and the fourth pada. It's, it's a complete list of sutras that detail how language is structured. So when I have a certain vibhakti, so you, some of you might have learned in school, Ramaha, Ramo, Ramaha, Ramam, Ramo, Brahma, and Ramena. So these are different vibhaktis, right? So you have first vibhakti, sixth, the second vibhakti, all the way to eighth vibhakti, Sambodhana vibhakti. Um, and so each of those vibhaktis or declensions, you know, convey a certain meaning. And so what Panini does is he tells you with these sutras in which sense, uh, in what context you apply each of those vibhaktis. So you get a really great understanding of how language is set up. Because while this Panini, of course, is only concerned with Sanskrit, um, you can really apply these to any language. Um, in fact, um, when I when I went to uh, Bilaspur, which is where Pushpa Dikshit, Dr. Pushpa Dikshit Mataji lives and teaches Sanskrit, and I was a student of hers for a long time. Um, when I first went to Bilaspur, she, which is in Chhattisgarh, where she lives, um, I didn't really know much Hindi. Um, I didn't know any Hindi actually. Um, but as I as I sort of put my mind, I mean, I, and I had to actually learn Hindi because all the lessons were taught in mostly Hindi. Um, so when I when I sort of put my, put sort of this effort in to learn Hindi so I could understand what was going on, I, I found myself sort of going back to how I learned Sanskrit or how Sanskrit is structured. So when there was this, when I was learning tenses in Hindi, um, I would always think of it in terms of Sanskrit automatically. This was there wasn't any sort of effort on my part uh, or effort put on my part. So and, and so, I, I, so when I when I think back to that it's almost sort of amazing that I never thought of it in terms of English or even my, uh, my, whole, my mother tongue, Tamil. And it's always in terms of Sanskrit because in Sanskrit, the structure is so clear as to which 
which uh, in, in what sense do you use what lakara or uh, tense and what vibhakti do you use and and what uh, you know other prepositions etc do you use and so for me that, that was a huge helping hand in even learning hindi so if you want to look at it from benefit you want to look at its benefits from another angle there you go um it, it gives you i think it sanskrit gives you a very strong understanding of how language is formed and if you want to ever learn a new language i think with sanskrit at the in the background can really help transform that process so I, so those are those will be sort of the few points i'll be touching on as to telling uh, uh unesha students why they should learn sanskrit because it is a, it's a valid question right i mean to most it seems like an ancient outdated even dead language um but I think there are really tangible benefits that modern students can, you know, glean from learning Sanskrit. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now uh, I will move on to music. Um, so uh, as as I mentioned before, um, my uh, my my sort of journey in in shastri studies has not only been in sanskrit but also heavily in music as well um and while learning music probably doesn't have the same direct and glaring advantages that learning sanskrit grammar or sanskrit nyaya or anything else has um i think it there's certainly things that it has done for me as a student um and so so the first thing is of course a uh, practice um and i think that's true of any sort of classical music system um whether be it western hindustani carnatic whatever um but i think learning music for me has sort of enforced this sense of discipline that i probably i don't know where i would have gone from otherwise um but having been homeschooled and and being homeschooled requires you to be extremely self-driven um, i think music the fact that that i have to sit down for you know four or five hours and and sing continuously in a structured way um and has you know really trained me to 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 when i approached any task to you know do it with us with the with you know with the game plan in mind and not sort of you know waste my time and and make sure i had a structure so i could keep myself you know motivated and keep myself going so i, I so that's so practice in music i think especially uh, helped me uh, you know build my attention span and and build discipline as well and but I, like i said those are those are things that you would probably get from any classical music system that you know involves us any sort of you know rigorous practice um but at, but but there is i think uh, a tangible benefit from i think even that carnatic music can uh, you know offer exclusively and that is when it comes to something called manodharma um so in carnatic music i don't know how many of you are familiar with carnatic music but we have a certain we have like this part of element of carnatic music called manodharma and manodharma is basically when an artist, when singing a song, um, sort of improvises upon that song. Um, so it can, it basically has three forms. That is raga alapana, which is like the ah uh, that you might hear in the, before a song in a concert. And then that is nerval, which is when you take a line of a sahitya or a line of lyrics and then sing it in your own way. Um, not, not the sort of separate from what the composer envisioned that that line of lyric to be. And then there is swara, which is a kalpana swara, which is when you when you take a line and then add on to it different different combinations of swaras. So sarigama padanisa, basically. And so these within these three forms, so these three together uh, put together are known as uh, manodharma in Carnatic music. And so in manodharma, uh, it's not just arbitrary, you know, you don't just blurt out any any old thing you want. I um, mean, that doesn't constitute an improvisation. Um, Manodharma involves a lot of actually arithmetic, arithmetical computation. Um, and because ultimately it has to sound pleasant to the listener's ear, right? Even though they may not know what's going on. So that is in the artist's hand. And so as a result, what you get is you have to, you have to sort of construct these Kalpana Swaras on the spot uh, in certain mathematical patterns because it also has to come to the correct beat and to do that you need to calculate say how many swaras i would need to come and land on that beat correctly so if i have an eight beat cycle which is sort of a very standard beat cycle called adi talam 
uh, when I have an eight beat cycle and I have say and I have uh, the song lyric starting on the first beat I would want to know okay if I do a sort what like sort of nice sounding um, um, grouping of swaras can I make so that it lands correctly on the beat so I say if I want to take just I want to sing in sixes uh, so like sari, sari gamma pada ni that is a six so if I want to just think patterns of sixes I would think okay so I have an eight beat cycle and I have, I have groupings of six so I could do eight into three which is 24 which is also divided by six so six into four so I would have to sing six uh, cycles of six four times and that would come on beat so these are calculations that have to be made right on the spot it's at the concert and they have to be precise because you have accompanists right that are also following you so if you make a single mistake if you're even off by one matra um, which is a fourth of a beat um, you can throw off the entire entire concert and it isn't pretty and i've seen it actually happen live so and it trust me it really isn't pretty um, so these sort of things of course require a lot of a lot of practice but they also so but so doing these sort of calculations of course six into four and eight into three is a very basic computation but when you start getting into higher levels of um, of uh, amano dharma you start encountering a lot of very very complex mathematical patterns and I won't get into those here and bore you guys to death, but um, ba so basically these, these sort of exercises and having to do this sort of, sort of performance uh, has really, really transformed the way I, or the speed at which I could do, you know, at small arithmetic calculations because, um, you know, in the American system, at least, which I'm a product of, um, the American schooling system, a lot of it is, is, I mean, they just give you a calculator in hand and you're babied in that sort of way, but um, and which is, I don't think is as true for the Indian system, but especially in the, in the, in the US uh, education system, they basically hand you a calculator and let that do all your computations for you. Um, and so, in, so doing Carnatic music in a lot of ways really helped me, you know, develop that quick, the ability to do quick calculations and quick sums and quick multiplications and quick divisions. So and that, was, that was huge for me. Um, especially when it came to, especially being uh, as someone who is going to do mathematics in college, um, that was something that uh, classical music gave me that I don't think I, in my situation, could have gotten from anything else. Um, my calculator was sort of the only thing that I had to do that sort of stuff for me. So, so Carnatic music really helped me in that regard. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, and I thought I'd talk about, uh, so, so basically these two, uh, Vyakaranam and, uh, and classical music are, were the, the two main elements of my, of my, my Shastric learning. Um, and that really contributed to my, my, my education and my involvement as a student, like I mentioned. But I thought I would also talk briefly about uh, a summer I spent with uh, Dr. K. Ramasubramaniam, who, um, who actually is one of the lecturers at the Unmesha camp in August. Um, and I, I thought it would be, I thought it would be important. I couldn't sort of mention my journey without talking about Ramasubramaniam, uh, Professor Ramasubramaniam. And um, so, so as, as some of you may or may not know, Ramas, uh, Dr. Ramasubramaniam is a is a professor um, at IIT, Madra, IIT Mumbai, sorry, IIT Mumbai, and he focuses on Indian systems of mathematics. Um, and I think Indian mathematics is something that we've all sort of heard about. We've heard about the occasional trick in Vedic mathematics, you know, that helps you. That, like, say, for instance, uh, all multiples of nine out of nine, things like that, right? Um, so, but I, that's like that's just sort of really scratching the surface, if if at all. Um, and so, Vedic mathematics and Indian mathematics in general is is something that is it's almost you can't comprehend it. It is that vast and that that comprehensive and that that effective and it's it's I, I like like you can see I'm struggling for words to describe it um, and I thought I'd just sort of give you a few examples of of how how wonderful Indian mathematics itself is and perhaps sort of give you a, a brief look into what Dr. Ramasubrani would be teaching at the at the Unmesha camp. Um, so for instance, what where in, with my time at uh, with uh, during my time with Ramasubramaniam sir. Um, uh, we looked at, you know, Chanda Shastra, um, and Chanda Shastra, for those who don't know, is is basically the the Shastra that governs how uh, how poetics are are applied in in Sahitya, in poetry and in literature. Um, so 
if you've ever studied English poetics, you know that um, there, are, there are six types of meters. You have iambic, um, dactylic, you have anapestic, you have trochaic, uh, you have spondaic. And so those are the five types of meters. And those, those meters are not based on time intervals. They're based on stress that you give to a certain letter. So um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a, uh, yeah, the, the Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold. So that's the first line of a, of a poem by, I believe, Lord Byron. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I can't exactly remember. But so when you, when you read that poem out, the, the stresses that you give to certain uh, letters and certain syllables is what dictates the, the meter. And the problem with that is people with different accents and, and, and different enunciation, um, and I've noticed this from, like, so from different parts of the world, it comes out completely differently because ultimately uh, it's very subjective, right? The way you enunciate a certain syllable. And so in, people with an American accent often, I found did it very differently from how I did it. Um, and so that you know, ended up <laughs> causing me a lot of confusion. But in Indian poetics, thank God, um, the, the meters are dictated by, uh, by syllabic instance. So it's all based on time intervals. So you have long, you have uh, either a long, which is a guru, or a short, which is a laghu, and those are based on sort of uh, time intervals called matra. So you have one matra for laghu, two matras for a guru, and so and each letter in the in each sort of syllabic combination in the Sanskrit alphabet is designated either a guru or laghu. So you know exactly the meter or the exact combination of syllables that you're saying when you recite a line of a poem. Um, so that is basically the foundation of, um, 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 so if you have say Gayatri Mantra, right? Om Bhur Bhavaswa, you can look at each, each syllable and each letter that is there in Om Bhur Bhavaswa, and you will come up with the, the, the meter that, that it is, Gayatri. And exactly, so it's not based on whether how, how you pronounce it or how you enunciate it. Um, so that, that is extremely helpful. So basically what, I, I did with Dr. Ramasubraman is look into each all of these different uh, meters and the mathematics behind them. So, for example, uh, in these in the Chanda Shastra by Pingala, um, which is a text I studied primarily, um, there are Pingala lists out methodologies to to obtain every single unique combination that you can get from a guru and lagu in an eight beat cycle. So, basically, what that means is. Like I mentioned before, if you have a eight beat cycle is a very standard uh, beat cycle. So in each each beat there can either be a guru or a laghu, right? Because those are your two possibilities. So okay, let's take a four beat cycle for instance. That'll be easier. So if you have a, if you have a four beat cycle um, and you have either guru or laghu for each beat is a possibility. So then you have two times two times two times two, sixteen combinations, right? Two to the power of four. So that's all fine and dandy. I mean, that any any of us can do. But then, when can you list out every single unique com every every one of the sixteen unique combinations? It's actually quite difficult um, when you start getting into larger and larger uh, uh, beat cycles. So if you have like a thirty-two beat cycle, how do you come up with every single every single po uh, unique possibility of gurus and lagus that can come out of that? Right. So that's two to the power of thirty-two. So think about it. It's a huge number. So in Pingala's Chandra Shastra, what, what, he, what Pingala lists out are methodologies to obtain every single one of those combinations. And they're quite complex um, and, and mathematically rigorous. But it's, it's amazing that, that such methodologies even exist. They don't really exist in Western mathematics. Um, but the scope that, that Indian mathematics has and with its direct application to Western mathematics is really incredible. So, uh, I, so yeah, so if any of you are, on the fence about Yoon Mesha as a program, uh, and Dr. Dr. Ramasubraman will be coming there and giving lectures. So I think for that alone, this program is a must because if you if just for the even if you're not interested in mathematics as a subject, just you'll be amazed, completely wowed at the scope that it, Indian mathematics has. Um, so you, I think that's it actually. Um, I don't have much else to say. Um, as an introduction to this this program, but if you can go to the next, okay, I I can go over this slide too. So like so, just to recap, um, my study with Shastra has um, 
has been benefited me in, in many ways, like I just, like I've mentioned over the last half an hour. Um, and those are, you know, memory, like I mentioned with music, concentration, again, you know, practicing and aptitude. And it comes to a sans when it comes to Sanskrit grammar, when you, when you have to uh, look at a problem, right? They give you a problem, like take this dhatu, like put, and then uh, add a certain pratyaya. Now, what are all the different sutras that apply? So to be to have the mental capacity to do a problem like that is 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 very very it, it takes a lot of work and a lot of memorization a lot of just mental agility because you need to know where to look to get you know to pull certain sutras from to apply to this problem and an exercise like that alone is you know in a lot of ways like a computer program if you have a certain result and you want to get to a certain result you need to work backwards and so Sanskrit grammar really teaches you how to do that. Um, and so, and so by, and by, if you do any number of those problems, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a really, really rigorous exercise in memory, concentration, aptitude, pretty much every single one of these bullet points um, and fun. And I think the most important and the most significant one of those is fun. And really, uh, if you, once you really get involved in doing any of these, any of these exercises, be it Sanskrit grammar, be it an Indian math problem, a Vedic math problem, uh, I think you'll, you'll really get lost in it. And, um, it's, it'll be really hard initially. It was for me as well, you know, to get used to that sort of system of thinking because it's it's very different from the way we are taught today. Um, uh, and it's a lot more rigorous. It's a lot more intensive, and the expectations are a lot higher. Um, and so, um, so once you get get sort of you know you get yourself gelled into that system, I, I think it's it's really an experience like no other. And I, I think Unmesha offers a, a really great you know window into what that's like. So um, if I think for that alone, it's worth going to a program like that. And there aren't many like that, if, if any at all, available um, and uh, that people are conducting. So you should definitely really give this program a chance. I think it's, it's probably one of the most unique and greatest experience that, uh, that students, especially from the U.S., can have because they don't, they will never really get that opportunity again, I believe, um, especially in, sort of in the circumstances and the environment that we study in and that we're grouped in. So, yeah, um, that's pretty much it. Um, uh, thank you again to the organizers for having me. It's, it's a huge honor. Um, and like I said, you can uh, follow Unmesh, uh, Agastya Gurukulam on social media and visit their website. Um, and I really highly recommend you doing so. Okay. And like I said, yeah, thank you for your time. And uh, it was a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Siddharth. And, um... Folks, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, type them up on the uh, chat window so that uh, we can uh, get those questions answered by Siddharth. We have a question from uh, Archana ji. Uh, I'll just read it out to you, Siddharth. Uh, what made you pick math and computer science for your college study? Is it because of the influence of studying Sanskrit and Vedic mathematics? Um, I think I would say that it sort of goes both ways. Um, I was very interested in mathematics in high school, ha having only studied Western mathematics. Uh, but I, uh, but when I st began studying uh, Sanskrit Vyakaranam and and Vedic mathematics that really sort of fueled the fire for me. Um, and when it especially when it came to mathematics because that was something that really uh, that I really focused on in high school and uh, outside of just doing Sanskrit and um, and and uh, music. But uh, but when it comes to computer science, I'd say Vyakaranam was probably played a huge part in influencing my decision to do computer science in particular. Um, because uh, once I saw once once I saw how much I was enjoying the process of taking different sutras, applying them, and you know solving those sort of problems, um, I, 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 I thought that you know maybe computer science might be something that I would be willing to try. And I, so far from what I've done, I, I, have, I didn't spend a lot of my high school doing computer science, only the last one or two years. But from what I've done so far, I've enjoyed it a, a lot. So uh, I'd say yeah, probably Sanskrit influenced me the most in, when it came to taking up computer science. But when it, for mathematics, I'd say it went both ways. It, it is always something that I was very interested in, but studying Indian mathematics and, and Sanskrit Vyakram just still really solidified my, my, you know, my urge to study uh, mathematics and pursue it in college as well. 
Thank you uh, for that. There's another question. At what age did you begin studying Sanskrit and Shastra? Okay. Um, I began studying uh, Sanskrit when I was, I think, about nine or ten. Um, and it was through Sanskrit Bharati, which is another organization that I recommend all of you checking out. Um, Sanskrit Bharati, you probably all have heard of it, um, but they, they basically teach Sambhashana Sanskritam, which is spoken Sanskritam. Um, and and that I think that as a as a as a way to enter into Sanskrit is a is sort of probably the, the best way to do it because it's it's something that is focused not on grammar and you know some of the things that are very sort of sort of dry for a, a and a, a big sort of a big uh, start a person who's starting out um, and um, so so it was really through Sanskrit Bharati that my interest in Sanskrit evolved and that and an eventuality of that was that I and got into Vyakaranam. And things like that but sanskrit bharati and their methodology of teaching spoken sanskrit i think really solidified my uh, my basis in sanskritam and so yeah like i like i said i really recommend all of you checking it out if you're interested in, in sort of starting out in sanskritam they have a great program um that that covers sort of the basics of sanskritam that you need to know Uh, Sri, we can't hear you very well. Is it better now? Hello? Yes, this is better now, yes. Yeah, so I was just saying there are some really cute videos on YouTube of Siddharth and his brother Ashok, um, where you know they have these interesting conversations at home in Sanskritam that uh, are very interesting to uh, watch and listen to. So you guys, uh, please do not miss uh, those videos on YouTube. Kind of tells you how Siddhartha has evolved from just learning some Bhashna Samskritam to Shastrik Samskritam over a period of time. Great. I think that's all we have uh, in the Q&A. Um, there, is, there is one more question I think we missed out. Uh, says, tell us more about uh, Stanford okay. and what uh, they were interested in, right? So maybe... How was your background helpful with your Stanford admission? Uh, okay, yeah. So, if if any you knew anything, know anything about the uh, the American college admissions process, um, it's pretty much a black hole when it comes to information. Um, but I I can, guess I can tell you uh, what I thought they were looking for and and what I sort of put in my application. Um, but uh, so basically. Um, when it came to Sanskrit and 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 mathematics, obviously I tried to highlight the fact that that I, I had a very unique approach to learning the subject, which I did, um, which was approaching it from a from a traditional ancient Indian perspective. Um, so of course I detailed my time with Dr. Ram Subramaniam, as well as my time with Sanskrit Bharati, um, teaching for them and um, and and teaching their ten day Shabiram and etc. Um, and also my, my study of Panini and Vyakaranam and how that motivated my interest to get into, to get into computer science. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, that was basically the idea behind that part of my application. But like I said, I mean, with the American system, uh, you really don't know. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty much, uh, it pretty much, I guess it depends on the admissions officer on that day, what they were feeling. And apparently one of them liked my application well enough to, yeah, offer me a offer me a place at Stanford. So, yeah, that's that's I think all I can say as far as I know. Um, but yeah, that, 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 so that was basically the approach I took with my application. If that's what you're looking for. Okay. Okay. I think that's all we have right now. Let uh, me just one Ganesh. one more question. One more question, sorry to interrupt. The question is on um, how was your experience with other high-ranked schools with your application? Uh, okay, so my experience with other high-ranked schools. Okay, so um, I applied to uh, Stanford. So for high-ranked schools, I, I can tell you uh, Stanford, uh, uh, Harvard, uh, as Columbia, Cornell, and those schools. Uh, Harvard didn't like me too much, so they rejected me. Um, and uh, Princeton, 
uh, uh, deferred me, but then by the time I, uh, and waitlisted me, but by the time I had gotten Stanford and that was my number one choice. So I, I took them and, and uh, denied the rest. But, and so those, I think those are the two schools that, that I didn't get into directly, but with, with you can see other ones, I don't know what your definition of high ranked is, but uh, um, uh, for me, I guess, I know I just studied the Ivy Leagues, I guess, and uh, Berkeley and stuff. So I got into those schools, uh, Berkeley, uh, Cornell, Columbia, UPenn, um, but yeah, Harvard wasn't too fascinated with my application, I guess. So they, they rejected me in Princeton as well. But like I said, I, I, got, I got the school that, uh, that I wanted the most. So I'm happy with that. Awesome. I think okay. that, that kind of concludes our uh, program today. And uh, thanks a lot, uh, folks, for attending. And uh, this video will be on YouTube as well. If you are, you got a friend uh, or a family member that missed out on attending this uh, session, please uh, point them to our YouTube channel and they can listen in on what Siddharth had to say. So thank you for spending uh, uh, this hour of your evening on a Friday with us and look forward to having you and your kid at Unmesha soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.